Energy in America. This time we're doing it on Friday afternoon with Lou Pugliarisi, who joins us from uh, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates uh, by VMIX Calls. Great to talk to you, Lou. Great to see you again. Great to see you. It's early in the morning here, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm up and ready. <laughs> and, you, and you left Jakarta, where you were involved in a big conference on LNG. Can you talk about the conference? Yeah, so yeah, let's talk a couple of minutes about this. This is part of a U.S.-Japan uh, cooperative effort on something called the Japan-United States uh, Strategic Energy Program, or JUSIP, as it's known. And it involves a cooperation between the U.S. and Japan on a large number of energy issues. One of them, I think one of the, one of his nuclear power and another one is on energy efficiency and climate. And the third one is on uh, LNG, particularly LNG in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and the you, basic fundamental. You, yeah. You're an organizer, no? You're an organizer of that program. Huh? I'm, a co I'm the sort of co-host of this with the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan, our sister think tank in Tokyo. It's great. And it demonstrates movement, doesn't it? It demonstrates a, a larger trend of U.S. involvement in the sale of LNG uh, in Asia, no? Yes, and I think we're going to talk about the broader implications of that today, and, and it might give your audience a sense of why this is so important. Okay, well, let's mm -hmm. let's start yeah. with that. Let's uh, start with your slides, as you will. This is Lou Pugliarisi. Okay. He's going to report to us on uh, LNG in Asia today, and uh, he is the president of EPRINC, the Energy Policy Research Organization, in Washington, D.C., but he gets a lot of travel in, and I told him I would carry his bag anytime. <laughs> you wouldn't enjoy it, Jay. <laughs> um, so uh, let's go to the first, uh, I think the first slide, just the title page. And uh, yeah, one of the things I want to talk about today is not just the economic value of this, but the geopolitical importance and uh, why it helps, uh, it might even, you might consider, compensate for uh, a lot of other concerns people have uh, about U.S. long-term commitment to the Asia-Pacific region. I think it's, we're going to be here. It's very important to U.S. national security as well as energy security. So mm -hmm. let's go to the next slide. I think the first point here is that we have to remember, you know, there's been a lot of talk over the years about a uh, Pacific pivot or Asian pivot. And it is without a doubt the Indo-Pacific region is the most single consequential region for uh, America's future. And the United States has actually initiated, even under Trump in the last two or three years, a large number of programs, Asia, Asia Edge, uh, initiatives I spoke to like JISUP. And a big part of this feature really is driven by the fact that the Indo-Pacific region is absolutely critical to the future of the United States. It's, that we've, uh, it's got nine of the 10 busiest seaports. It's got, the region includes the world's largest economies, US, China, and Japan, and also six of the world's fastest growing economies, India, Cambodia, Laos, Burma, Nepal. A quarter of our US exports go to Indo-Pacific, and actually exports to China and India have doubled over the past decade. Mm. And you know, it's very important to remember this is really the result of a free and open trade routes through the air, sea, bird space, even the cyber, mm -hmm. even the cyberspace. And so it's a critical kind of the region for the future of the United States. Let and me ask you about managed. one distinction, Lou. You know, in, yeah. in, in a lot of these countries, the energy trade mm -hmm. is done actually by the government. And when you say that, you know, the government is interested in LNG or participating in international energy trade, uh, you're really talking about that country uh, as a government. When you're talking about the United I, I, States, it isn't the government. It's individual no, energy I, companies, right? Actually, this is a good point. I, I, first, I, you are absolutely correct. And I think part of it is, is that, of course, the U.S. does need a lot of regulatory approvals to get the LNG on the water. And, but it is a relatively free market in the U.S. Once you get the regulatory approvals, you can produce as much LNG as you, as you want. I mean, once you, all the export licenses are issued, and you can send it almost anywhere in the world except probably Iran and North Korea. Mm -hmm. So it's a very much of an open market. And it's, it's a fundamental change the way the world did LNG in the past. 
In the past, these were point-to-point -point sales, uh, very specific destination restrictions. So the U.S. has really revolutionized this market right now. What interests me, and, though, is part of, part of the introduction of the topic today, uh, and you mentioned it, is uh, how U.S. energy exports, uh, specifically LNG, support the security and geopolitical interests of the United States. Well, what, what's interesting about that, and, I, and I, I offer it to you as a thought, is that it's not the United States government uh, that is doing this activity to support the security and geopolitical interests of the United States. It's private companies. And it's the actions and Absolutely. sales of private companies that are supporting the United States, right? Absolutely. And, but I think they're also supporting their stockholders because they <laughs> wouldn't be doing this unless there was a rate of return. Absolutely. So the, US, <laughs> so the regulatory framework has to be there. It has to be positive. The government has to view it. I mean, there's, there are a lot of forces in the U.S. who don't want to see natural gas develop. They, don't, mm -hmm. they view it inhibiting our transition to the fuels of the future. Mm -hmm. But in Asia, you're absolutely right, because a lot of this gas goes into the power sector. The power sector is either highly regulated or owned by you know, various countries. Uh, and uh, although that's changing in Japan, and in a, lot of the new, a lot of the new sort of what you call Pacific tigers, when they look at LNG, their concern is, okay, I'm interested in this. It's clean fuel, but I'll be thrown out if my power prices go way up. So there's a reluctance to make long-term commitments. So there's a lot of interesting work underway to see how LNG can fit into shorter-term contracts, uh, be more sensitive on the price side. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a very, very delicate issue. And you're I mean. right there. You're right there at that point. I, I want everybody we're to right appreciate there. that. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're right in the eye of the storm on this one. Right. So, and of course, this is driven by, if we go to the next slide, this is driven, the, I think it's very important to understand, in the United States, we have some of the lowest natural gas prices in the world. Probably, you know, except for places where it's dominated by the government, natural gas prices are about $2,000, I mean, $2, $2 uh, uh, a million BTU or a, or a thousand cubic feet. And uh, you can see here, even with these low prices, the efficiency of the North American production platform as such is that US production has continued to grow. And by that blue line, you can see here that the percent going to exports is rising. And it's actually rising quite fast, as you can see from the next slide. <clears throat> so, the U.S. in 2016 was virtually a zero exporter of liquefied natural gas. And today, it's uh, by 2020, it's going to hit something called 67 million tons or about 9 billion cubic feet a day. And that, within a period of three years, we've gone from zero to more than 20% of global LNG trade. Most forecasts show the U.S. as being the largest LNG exporter in the world by 2025. So it's quite important to understand that this is very disruptive. It's changing the whole world oil market. And it's giving lots of countries who have been reliant on coal access to a much cleaner fuel. Is there political tension on this? I mean, for example, if I'm in the oil business rather than in the LNG business, I would look across the way and say, gee, they're, they're eating my lunch. Uh, I, well, you know, I would rather sell everybody, oil. Almost everybody who's in the oil business is also in the gas business. Okay. So, I think that, <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of it. The other part of it is that these are really kind of distinct markets. Mm -hmm. The power sector and the distribution, residential distribution center for gas, no longer relies on oil at all. Mm -hmm. So... It's really a fight between coal and, in some cases, renewables. And uh, there may be a few other exotic fuel out there, like wood pellets or something, but it's mostly <laughs> that's where the battle is being fought out. Uh -huh. The petroleum or liquid, the, the liquid market, you know, there might be some competition in the marine bunker fuel area, but liquids are being driven by petrochemicals and gasoline and diesel. Uh -huh. Okay, the other interesting thing about the Pacific is we go to the, uh, to the next slide, 
is that um, in the Asia Pacific gas markets, there's like three mature countries, Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. And the reason I call them mature is they have dominated world LNG trade for 30, 40 years. And they are the largest purchasers of LNG. Uh, oh, and they have made the market, right? And so what's different now is that their markets are kind of stabilizing, their demographics, their power sector are not growing dramatically. And so the action in LNG in the Pacific is occurring in these key newer markets, which are trying to sort of clean up their fuel base. So we go to the next uh, picture, you can see this here. And here you can see here, the Philippines, Thailand, India, and then China. And, and you don't have to be that observant to take a look at that blue space and see, yeah, the future of LNG in, the, in Asia is going to depend on what the Chinese do. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese have access to their own supplies, which they've been working on, but that's not been that successful. They have pipeline gas from Kazakhstan and uh, Turkmenistan, and they also have pipeline gas from Russia and, Mal and Myanmar. Mm -hmm. But uh, last year, their, uh, their largest source of growth was imports of LNG. Is that and affected the by, the, year, by the, uh, the trade war, the tariff war right now? If they're importing from the United to, States, what to, effect? Yes, we're going to get to that. Okay. And, uh, it's, it, is, it is a problem and it's not a problem. And the way to think about it is this way. They're a big portfolio, what they call portfolio players. People like a company called Jera in, in Japan and other parts of uh, all the, some of the big oil companies. And they, they purchase or produce LNG from a wide range of uh, geographic locations. And then they're in the position to allocate that LNG in a way that minimizes transportation costs. So while it may be efficient for some, for US LNG to go to China, it's actually more important, important for the government, for, for the market to get bigger because a big portfolio but can take the US LNG and they have Australian LNG and other LNG and just reallocate it and say, oh, you don't want, you're gonna put a tariff on US LNG Here's the Australian LNG I'm going to take and substitute the US LNG for markets that don't have mm -hmm. a tariff. But mm -hmm. it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, this, this trade war with, with, with China, is, we have to find a way out of this. If you watch what happened to the stock market, uh, you'll oh, see yeah. what I'm talking about. Even today. Well, let me ask you one more Even question today. about these charts. Um, you know, the, the charts suggest that a, a, a greater volume of LNG is going to the you know, bigger countries and to the smaller countries um, in, uh, in Asia. But, and there's, so there's this, this obvious growth in the amount of LNG that they're taking, but they can't really buy it if they don't have the infrastructure to move it around within the country. I guess that means mostly uh, pipelines. And they have to uh, adapt their, uh, their, their equipment, their uh, utilities, I suppose, uh, to run on LNG. That requires a lot of money. And I'm wondering yes, who, is who is providing the money, who is providing the technology, who's on the ground helping them build the infrastructure that supports their increased purchases? Yeah, this is actually also a great point. Yes, if you do not have what's called regasification, if you don't have a regulatory structure to deal with the, uh, the vagaries in LNG pricing, if you don't have all these sorts of things, that market's going to grow very slowly. So one of, you, you do have um, a big program between the U.S. and Japan to build out the human capital, if you like, or the regulatory structure to help the countries with a series of training programs. Then you have the, the, inter, the international financial institutions like the, uh, the IFC, which is a sort of arm of the World Bank, you are affiliated with the World Bank. Uh, it's a completely separate organization 
And the IFC has been very instrumental in organizing the financing for like an LNG regas regasification facility and uh, uh, development of a power plant or what they call floating storage regas units. In fact, last year there were two new entrants into the LNG field, you would be quite surprised. One was Panama and the other was Bangladesh. Ah, interesting. So, uh, yeah, so it is, but it is a very complicated issue and it is one which takes a lot of, a lot of hard work and, and, and the governments are, I would say, very cautious, very careful how they proceed because they don't want to get stuck with the fuel that's going to spike power prices. Mm -hmm. This is why India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they hang on to their coal-fired power so, uh, so strongly. Yeah. But uh, it seems to me okay. going forward that we want them to, uh, we as the exporter of the LNG, we want them to have the ability uh, to build their LNG infrastructure and, and we should be helping them or at least advising them uh, on how to do that and, to increase and, our own exports. And that's a good piece of the Japan-US uh, cooperation on this, uh, this project. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a side benefit to all of us in that to the extent US LNG made way throughout the Pacific, it provides, a, let's say, a heightened understanding of the value of the US Navy and why these open and free uh, trade routes are very important to the United States and to our allies throughout the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And notwithstanding some of the comments made by uh, President Trump, uh, I would say the the commitment to this in the Pacific is 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 very real. Mm -hmm. So let's we can go see the next. Let's go to the next picture here for a second. Uh, you can see here that it's it is finding the U, U.S. LNG goes into the world market. Actually, last year very large uh, LNG prices are down right now. Most people don't think that will last long, but a large volumes of LNG made it into Europe last year. Some of mm -hmm. it goes into storage and stuff. And, but you can see here from this chart that India and China uh, are entering into the, into the market in a way that they're drawing U.S. LNG to those sites. So uh, this, this remains very important for the future of this market. And uh, as, you, as we pointed out already, uh, we need to find a way to give these countries a lot of flexibility shorter term contracts, uh, the ability to uh, operate LNG on a seasonal basis, all features of the LNG market, which were a heavy capital market, I mean, a heavy capital formation required, have not been a, the case in the past. But the, the banks and the financial institutions and the technology are all emerging to allow a lot more flexibility in both the development and the distribution of LNG. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the next picture, I think this is exactly what uh, you were talking about, Jay. This shows U.S. Tariff, uh, tariff revenue, 12-month rolling total. I think, yeah, there's two interesting things about this chart for me. One is U.S. has been collecting a lot of tariffs, even going back to 2012. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you can see the spike under the... Uh, you can see the spike in revenues under the Trump administration here in 20, starting in 20, late 2017, 2018. And, you know, we've gone from about 30 to 60 billion. So an increment of $30 billion in tariffs. Mm -hmm. Actually for the U.S. economy, it's not a colossal number, but it is causing a lot of problems, I would say, in, you know, you know in developing longer term markets, particularly in China. So that's something we're going to have to we're going to have to fix this problem. I don't know how we're going to fix it, but we're going to have to fix it. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to the last uh, the last picture here, or the second to last picture, um, this shows you global LNG demand uh, by 2030. Now, these are based off a series of models. All models are wrong, but uh, as we say, some are useful. And I think what, what this shows is the potential, not, this is not a prediction or a forecast, but 
the uh, what we say an optimistic potential. And you can see by that bar that the U.S. is in a position to fulfill a large increment of the growth in demand, a very large increment. Mm -hmm. So we will be con connected to both Asia and Europe in a very fundamental, important way as an energy order. This is a kind of very unusual development. It's all driven by the uh, technological advances, uh, some people, what you would call hydro hydraulic fracturing or the extraction of unconventional resources in the U.S. That makes the U.S. a major, major exporter of not just gas, but also oil and petroleum products. So this is this is a, a very interesting development. It changes a lot of things, including the security relationship that a lot of countries have had with the Middle East. Yeah. And, well, before you go, before you go to the next slide, though, let me ask you yeah. this: uh, I think sure. it was just yesterday. Uh, when, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Sanders, uh, one of the campaign, uh, campaigners for president, uh, announced mm -hmm. his, his uh, energy program. Um, and uh, he said he wanted to spend, I think it was $16 trillion on developing clean energy by that same year you mentioned, 2030. Uh, what is that, That's so, 10 plus years from now? Where, where does I that fit? Where well, I don't know where that fits, but I don't know where he's going to get the money to do that. Yeah. So he's because what he's suggesting is probably not an economically sound program. Right now, the North American production platform, the United States, largely the United States, but Canada and Mexico together, produce uh, one quarter of the world's oil production. Uh, that platform is worth a trillion dollars. It employs millions of people in all kinds of ancillary uh, you know, uh, industries to support oil and gas development. It is a huge strategic benefit for the U.S. And uh, a lot of it is driven by policies in the states, not the federal government, mm -hmm. particularly places like Oklahoma and Pennsylvania. So people, he can say whatever he wants. I just think it's ludicrous to think you're going to get that kind of transformation in 10 years. Huge you amount of money. Huge. So now we have yeah, Bolsonaro. Not gonna, it's not going to happen. We have Bolsonaro in, uh, in Brazil, the lungs, <laughs> the lungs of the world, they call the, the rainforest there. And it, it heightens uh, awareness about uh, climate change. And uh, the news is that everybody's mad at Bolsonaro for having uh, you know, ignored the climate change, the climate change prospect in Brazil. Um, and he denies it, sort of like Trump. But the question I put to you is, you know, where, where do these charts, the LNG, these enormous uh, transactions, these enormous changes you're talking about, where do they fit against climate change and dealing with climate change and, you know, the so problem I, I of climate change? So I would say that, and I'm not going to use the word bridge fuel, but to the extent that we expand gas production and distribution worldwide, we are backing out coal and heavy fuel oil. And at the and that exchange, every time that happens, that reduces CO2 emissions. So it's not it's not everyone moving in a cave and working on, you know, pedaling their bicycle to generate their power. I got that. But <laughs> it is it provides the massive amount of BTUs you need to run the world's economy. And there's going to be a very important role for renewables, a very important role, but it's not going to happen as fast as people would like. And even under the Bernie Sanders plan, the fund, I, I don't think people have a clue of how big this market is and how important it is in terms of the sort of energy density it provides to the world markets. We still have about a billion people who don't have any power at all in the world. It happened with just solar power. Mm -hmm. Renewables are gonna have a big role, but they're not gonna be enough. Mm -hmm. That's actually the reality. Okay, that's the reality. I mean, I, so if you don't want to live in, fan, in Disneyland or fantasy, fantasy world, you're going to have to use fossil fuels for a while. Yeah, Lua, may I say that we count on you for the reality. This is, it's really important to be able to talk to you about this. Right. And if we go to the last picture, I just want to give you a sense of kind of what these meetings look like. So that's a meeting in Washington, D.C. we just had. And uh, 
you can see uh, it's people are very working diligently <laughs> to kind of move move the ball forward on this issue. Yeah, well, that's a serious meeting for sure. Yeah. But one one thing strikes me. I mean, I really have I have a couple of questions for you to to close here. Uh, one is um, so we're talking about Asia, um, and uh, you know very important transform transformational things. Uh, between the U.S. and really all parts of Indo-Asia. Um, but what about Europe? Uh, doesn't Europe need, isn't Europe a potential market for our, uh, you know, LNG as well? Actually, Europe is a very big market uh, for the U.S. It's not growing, but the a decision by the Dutch government to shut down the Groningen field, the uh, uh, shift in the energy mix in Europe, uh, is going to uh, continue to draw heavily on LNG from the world market. And a lot of that's going to be provided by the U.S. So, in fact, Europe was the biggest market for U.S. LNG last year. Well, we're a better, more uh, even-handed seller, I hope, uh, than Gazprom. And I wonder where Gazprom fits in the competition, not only to Europe, but I suppose to parts of Asia as well. They have gas um, and they have yes. pipelines and so forth. So even the, the, the Russians even have some LNG through a company called Novatech, and they have been uh, moving some of that LNG into the, uh, into the Pacific market. Uh, the so-called Nord Stream 2 project, which is this new pipeline to bring gas from uh, Russia to Europe, uh, will likely bypass Ukraine. I mean, it's going to bypass Ukraine. And, but the Europeans have a fairly integrated uh, grid now for gas. It's very competitive. And uh, that's almost the subject of another program because they, there's a lot of interesting geopolitical and uh, European-Russian relations tied to that program. Mm -hmm. We should definitely do that program. But let me ask you yeah. one last thing before we close, and that is, you know, we've seen... Uh, charts and graphs, and indeed, that's, that's a lot of what ePrink is about, uh, showing the, you know, the growth of uh, these sales, exports of uh, LNG to Asia. Um, but what's the future? Uh, you know, let's take another look at that 10 years. What, what do you think will happen? Will the growth that we are experiencing now continue? Will it increase, decrease, go flat? Uh, where is the U.S. going to be as, as, the, as the period goes by? So I think the fundamentals of U.S., what the U.S. has is a very large supply of cheap gas. And if the technology can keep pace, that gas is going to be a big feature in the world market. And, that, and that, that's going to depend on the cost of alternatives, uh, the willingness of the buyers to take on some longer term, but not necessarily 20 year commitments and the, the, you know, the economic growth of the world market. So if the, you know, you have rising incomes, you have more and more people entering the middle class. They want all the things we have here in the West and gas is going to be a big piece of that. And that gas is very, very competitively priced. And that's why it's going to be in those markets. And so we have to continue to make the exports uh, and support the infrastructure and so forth in the years to come. It's in our, as you said, our national interest. I, I, I absolutely, that's absolutely true. We need to, it's, it's a very important feature of the American energy complex. And it's also very important to our security and the security of our allies. Well, thank you so much, Lou. It's great to talk to you. Let me say that the broadband in uh, Dubai is, uh, is is far better than the broadband in Jakarta. But we will follow you anywhere you go. Right. Okay, okay. I'm heading home tomorrow. So. All right. We'll talk to you again All in right, Washington. Jim. Very nice to talk to you. Take Thanks care. so much. Namaste. Yeah, namaste. <laughs>